Well, we're winding down in our uh, series on the festivals of the Lord. We've been talking about the Old Testament festivals and the prophetic significance behind each of those. And so it's been an exciting week for me as I've studied about the Day of Atonement that we're going to talk about this morning. Lots of stuff in the Bible uh, about the Day of Atonement. Last Sunday we talked about the Festival of Trumpets. And I shared with you my belief that the festival of trumpets will find its ultimate fulfillment in the rapture of the church. When the Lord Jesus Christ returns, the Bible says that he'll come like a thief in the night, and there'll be the trumpet blast, uh, the trump of God and the, the voice of the archangel, and the dead in Christ shall rise first, and those of us who remain in our lives shall be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. And so it's uh, centered around the trumpet blast, the festival of trumpets, or Rosh Hashanah, which was the first day on the, the civil calendar of the, the Jews. And so 10 days after Rosh Hashanah, 10 days after the festival of trumpets, was the Day of Atonement. And so that's what we're going to look at this morning. And in your Bibles, in Leviticus chapter 23, we have some verses here that uh, tell us about the festival of the Day of Atonement, a one-day observance. And in Leviticus 23, beginning at verse 26, it says, The Lord said to Moses, The tenth day of this seventh month is the day of atonement. It says, Hold a sacred assembly and deny yourselves and present an offering made to the Lord by fire. Do no work on that day. And so it goes on, a few more verses there, but we won't read all of those. and gives uh, more information about this particular day. Three times in this passage, through verse 32, they are told to deny themselves. Now that means that they were to go without eating. And so this was the only designated, required day of fasting among the Jewish people in the Torah. Now you could have voluntary days of fasting, of course, but this is a required day of fasting. And three times in this passage, through verse 32, they were told, do not eat on this day. So it was a day of fasting. And they're also told to do no work on that day, and that also was repeated three times. Don't do any work. So they had specific, detailed information that they were given about this very, very special day, a very sacred day that, uh, of course, we're going to look at this morning and what all the significance behind that is. So the Day of Atonement, very, very significant to the Jewish people and uh, very uh, exact, precise instructions were given that they were expected to follow. The Day of Atonement, what does that mean? Well, in the Hebrew, Yom Kippurim means Day of Atonements. It's plural. And so that comes out of that verse that we just read there in Leviticus 23, Day of Atonements, plural. And so there were several things that the high priest had to do to prepare the tabernacle and prepare the altar. And all of that had to be done precisely uh, according to the instructions that they were to be given here in order for atonement to be made before the Lord. Atonement is when a price is paid for something, something is given uh, to appease the Lord. And so that's why this is called the Day of Atonements. It's plural. And you're going to see the things, the specific things that they had to do on this particular day. Now it's interesting, the 10 days between Rosh Hashanah, which was the Festival of Trumpets, and Yom Kippur, which is the Day of Atonement, were called Days of Awe. Days of Awe. The Jewish people called them the Days of Awe. And that meant for these ten days, they were to reflect on their, their relationship with the Lord. They were to give thought to their personal behavior, their attitude, uh, whether or not they were involved in anything that would be inappropriate before the Lord. And so these were to be 10 days of repentance when they would turn away from sin. To repent means to turn, to turn away from sin and to turn yourself towards the Lord. And so they, they became known as the 10 days of awe. And so all of this uh, that we've been looking at here in the fall festivals are building up to this day of atonement. Uh, during the month of Elul, which was the month prior to this, month of Tishri, uh, every single weekday, every day except the Sabbath, they were to sound a trumpet. And so they're building up to this day. And then, of course, last Sunday we saw on the Festival of Trumpets, Rosh Hashanah, that first day of the month of Tishri, 
is when it focused on the blowing of the shofar, the blowing of the trumpets. And of course, I think that represented the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ at the rapture of the church. And now 10 days later, just 10 days later, after Rosh Hashanah, you have Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. And so there's great emphasis building up to this particular day when these amazing, spectacular things happened uh, in the Old Testament period. And we're going to look at that this morning. Very interesting. And so you're going to need your Bibles this morning. There's so many verses I want us to look at. I couldn't get them all in your outline, okay? So open your Bibles to Leviticus chapter 16. The whole chapter of 16 in Leviticus tells us about the Day of Atonement. And we're told these specific activities that uh, the high priest in particular was to uh, oversee and to take care of. And so the first thing we're going to notice here on this day is the cleansing of the tabernacle. The preparation of the tabernacle and the cleansing of the tabernacle for the arrival of the presence of the Lord, which is going to be very, very spectacular. And so Aaron was directed to make atonement for several things that we're going to look at. And we're told in this chapter that he had to go through some specific uh, uh, operations before he could do this. He had to bathe himself thoroughly, take off his regular you know, garments, priestly garments, and bathe himself until he was very clean. And then he put on linen garments, very special linen garments. And so he would wear these linen garments as he was doing these particular activities that we're going to look at. And then at the end of those, he had to take these linen garments off again and bathe again put his priestly garments back on, and then offer sacrificial animals on the, on the altar, a burnt offering to the Lord. You say, well, why in the world did the Lord make him do such uh, precise things? It seems so odd to us. You're going to see as we go through this this morning that the Lord shows us how there's such a, a, a vast contrast and distinction between the holiness of God and the sinfulness of mankind that God is absolutely perfect. God is completely holy, which means to be set apart. He is set apart from sin. But we, of course, are sinners. And so our sinfulness, our wickedness, and our evil separates us from a holy God. And the only way that we can have a relationship with God, the only way we can come into the presence of the Lord is to have our sins forgiven. And that has to require a special, perfect sacrifice. We've seen that all throughout these festivals. Uh, the fact that they had to have sacrificial animals that were without a defect of any kind, representing the Lord Jesus Christ. The blood, of course, had to be shed. The life had to be given of these innocent animals on behalf of the people. And all of that represented, of course, Jesus Christ as the Passover lamb, the perfect sacrifice for sin. And so... We're going to see this morning how the, the holiness of God is emphasized and our sinfulness, the sinfulness of individuals is emphasized as well and how we're separated because of that sin. So there's three things here that Aaron was directed to make atonement for. And the first one here is in verse 11. It's uh, the cleansing of the most holy place. I think the King James Version says the holy of holies. And so this was a very, very special room that was inside the tabernacle, the tent at first, of course, and then the, the temple was built later. But a smaller room at the back of the tabernacle was called the Holy of Holies or the Most Holy Place. And in verse 11, uh, the Bible says that Aaron was told to bring the bull, a bull for his own sin offering to make atonement for himself and his household and to slaughter the bull for his own sin offering. Then jump down to verse 14. It says, he is to take some of the bull's blood and with his finger sprinkle it on the front of the atonement cover. Then he shall sprinkle some of it with his finger seven times before the atonement cover. That's the, the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant. He shall then slaughter the goat for a sin offering for the people and take its blood behind the curtain and do with it as he did with the bull's blood. He shall sprinkle it on the atonement cover and in front of it. And in this way he will make atonement for the most holy place because of the uncleanness and rebellion of the Israelites, whatever their sins have been. And so Aaron had to take a bull and slaughter the bull and take some of its blood, go into the Holy of Holies and, and present that blood on behalf of his own sin and the sin of his family. 
Then he had to slaughter a goat and bring the blood of the goat into the Holy of Holies and to do the same thing before the Ark of the Covenant in order to cleanse this place and to make atonement on behalf of the people because of their sins. It's interesting that he was to put his finger in the blood and to flick his finger seven times on the atonement cover or the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant. You remember the Ark of the Covenant, that golden box that had the Ten Commandments in it and, and Aaron's rod that budded, uh, the jar of manna. This, of course, was a very, very special article that was in the Holy of Holies. It was the only article in the Holy of Holies. And so Aaron had to flick his finger seven times. We all know the number seven is significant. It's the number of perfection, the number of completion. Seven times with the blood of the bull and then seven times with the blood of the goat, okay? So this is very interesting. And so he had to do this to, to sanctify or to cleanse the Holy of Holies. And then secondly, he had to do the same thing for the tent of meeting. Now there's two references to the tent of meeting in the Old Testament. Early on, there was a temporary tent that was outside the camp that Moses would meet with the Lord in. And the Bible says that the glory of the Lord would appear and come down into this tent and Moses would go into the tent and, and have conversations with the Lord. And so it was called the tent of meeting. And then later we get to the tabernacle that we're looking at here. And it also was referred to as the tent of meeting. So sometimes it gets a little confusing. Inside the tent of meeting, of course, you had the Holy of Holies. But then the bigger room before you entered into the Holy of Holies was just called the holy place. And that was a big part of the tabernacle. It had the other articles like the bread of, you know, the, the table of showbread, the the uh, lampstand, uh, the uh, table of incense, those kinds of things were in the uh, holy place. And so look at verse 16, the last part of verse 16. It says that he, Aaron, is to do the same thing for the tent of meeting, which is among them in the midst of their uncleanness. No one is to be in the tent of meeting from the time Aaron goes in to make atonement in the most holy place until he comes out, having made atonement for himself, his household, and the whole community of Israel. And so Aaron had to make atonement for the tent itself, for the tabernacle. Some believe that he also went to all the articles and the furnishings that were inside the tent of meeting, the holy place, and do the same thing with the blood that he had done in the Holy of Holies. And so it had to be cleansed. It had to be prepared for what was about to happen, what was about to come. Then he had to do uh, the same thing, make atonement for the altar, which was outside the tabernacle where they offered these burnt offerings. And on the four corners of this altar were horns. And the Bible talks about the horns of the altar, horns that uh, protruded from the four corners of the altar. Notice in verses 18 and 19, it says, Then he shall come out to the altar that is before the Lord, and make atonement for it. He shall take some of the bull's blood and some of the goat's blood, put it on all the horns of the altar. He shall sprinkle some of the blood on it with his fingers seven times to cleanse it and to consecrate it from the uncleanness of the Israelites. Now again, all of this information, all of these instructions are given obviously to represent the holiness of God and the sinfulness of mankind. God is perfect. He is without sin. He's absolutely perfect. And God being holy cannot allow us to enter into a relationship with him or enter into the presence of the Lord in heaven unless our sin problem is dealt with. And there is no way that we could ever be good enough on our own in our sinfulness to appease the Lord, right? God's standard is absolute perfection. None of us could ever achieve that because we're sinners, right? And only someone without sin could pay the price for our sins. And of course, that's where Jesus comes. Jesus, the Son of God, came, offered himself as a perfect sacrifice for sins on the cross that we might have the opportunity and the privilege of entering into the relationship with the Lord in the presence of the Lord and someday go to heaven. And so that's the only way it could happen. I couldn't pay the price for you because I'm a sinner. You couldn't pay the price for me because you're a sinner, right? We're all sinners. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. 
Only the Lord himself could pay the price. The scriptures say that God purchased the church with what? His own blood. Jesus, the Son of God, God in the flesh, offered himself as a sacrifice for our sins. Isn't this, isn't this just incredible? The, the symbolism and the, the prophecy here uh, between what the, the high priest had to do to prepare the tabernacle for what is about to come, and that is the appearing of the glory of the Lord. And so you have this cleansing that take place, and, and, and Aaron had to go through all these procedures. Remember, a short time before this, his two sons died because they did not follow the instructions of the Lord. In uh, Leviticus chapter 10, we're told that Aaron's two sons, Nadab and Abihu, I told the kids a while ago I was going to name my kids that, and uh, Charlotte wouldn't let me, uh, Nadab and Abihu were his two boys, and they were functioning as priests. And so they were told exactly how they were to function and what they were to do and how they were to present uh, fire before the Lord and all that. They had these fire pans that they put hot coals in from the altar, and they put incense on that, and they didn't do it right. Apparently they got coals from somewhere else. And they probably thought, oh, yeah, it's no big deal. You know, it's, it's just coals. You know, we can get those anywhere, right? And so they didn't go through the proper procedure. If you go back and look in Leviticus chapter 10, it says when they offered this unauthorized fire, they presented this unauthorized fire before the Lord, that fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed them and killed them, just like that. Aaron standing there and his two boys have just been burned to death. And Moses, I'm going to paraphrase here, Moses kind of said, Aaron, now I told you exactly how we had to be careful about this because this represents the holiness of God and the presence of God himself. And if you don't do this properly, you can't survive. You're not going to live. And he told Aaron and he told Aaron's family, now don't you show any grief at all. This, this, we can't, don't show any grief before the Lord. You better discipline yourself here because this represents the holiness of God. The Bible says that Aaron just stood there and he didn't say anything. And two of his nephews, cousins, came and carried off the bodies of Nadab and Abihu and took them away from the presence of the Lord because of uh, their disobedience and not following the exact instructions of the Lord. All of this is to show us that there must be a perfect sacrifice for sin. We cannot possibly, possibly achieve the forgiveness of sins on our own. Salvation is by the grace of God, right? For by grace are you saved through faith, and this not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And so that's the only way we can have forgiveness, is through that perfect sacrifice of our Lord. And so Aaron had to go through all these procedures to cleanse and prepare the tabernacle. And this builds up to the, the second thing here, the glorious appearance of the Lord. The glorious appearance of the Lord. In verse 2, it says, The Lord said to Moses, Tell your brother Aaron not to come whenever he chooses into the most holy place, behind the curtain in front of the atonement cover on the ark, or else he will die just like his sons, because I will appear in the cloud over the atonement cover. The atonement cover is sometimes called the mercy seat, the cover of the ark of the covenant. And inside the Ark of the Covenant were the Ten Commandments, the testimony, they're called. And so the Lord himself is going to appear in amazing supernatural glory over the atonement cover of the Ark of the Covenant. We're told that there were two angels called cherubim that were on top of this mercy seat, on top of this Ark, and that they faced one another with their wings outstretched and that the glory of the Lord would appear between these two cherubim in the presence of the high priest. There's a thick veil or curtain that separated the Holy of Holies from the holy place, and only the high priest could go behind that curtain, and only one day a year on the Day of Atonement, and not without blood. He had to take the blood of these sacrificial animals with him and make atonement, or he'd die. And so the glorious appearing of the Lord is about to happen as Aaron enters into the Holy of Holies. Now, if you take a look at these next verses here in, in verses 12 and 13, it says that he was to take a censer full of burning coals from the altar, 
before the Lord and two handfuls of finely ground fragrant incense and take them behind the curtain. Any of you ever burn any incense in your home? We never really got into that, but some folks like to burn incense into their home. It's fragrant, you know, it has a, a, a scent to it and everything, and it's got smoke that comes off of it and everything. And, and so Aaron was told to take two handfuls of incense and to put it on this censer that had burning coals in it from the altar of the Lord. It says, put the incense on the fire before the Lord, and the smoke of the incense will conceal the atonement cover above the testimony so that he will not die. And so again, if Aaron didn't follow these instructions to the letter, he would not survive when the presence of the Lord manifest itself above the Ark of the Covenant. Isn't that exciting? Can you imagine what that must have been like for Aaron to experience that? I mean, I'd have been scared to death, you know, to enter into that place and to think about what was about to occur when the glory of God himself is going to appear. And so he had to, he had to take this incense and burn this incense from this censer that had coals from the altar to fill this room, which was not a big room, had to fill this room with smoke before the Lord's presence would manifest itself. If he didn't do it just right, he would die. Now, the glory of the Lord is called the Shekinah, the Shekinah. It's a word that's not found in Scripture. It's actually in the Jewish writings, rabbinical writings about this particular occasion. And so the glory of the Lord is called the Shekinah, which is a word that means that which dwells. That which dwells between the two cherubim on top of the Ark of the Covenant. Now this is really interesting. This, this luminous cloud that would appear above the Ark of the Covenant also was above the tabernacle itself. And whenever that cloud would lift up and, and move, that's when the Israelites knew it was time to pack up, to pitch their tents and pack up and to, to go wherever the Lord would lead them. So the Lord would lead them with this pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. And we're told that it was luminous. It had like lightning in it or it was glowing or something that was just incredible, supernatural. And again, it must have been incredible to behold the glory of the Lord. This, of course, was the glory of the Lord being revealed, or the Shekinah. And so it was something that uh, only occurred once a year on the Day of Atonement when the Lord manifest himself above the Ark of the Covenant. And so take note of that. We've got the cleansing or the preparation of the tabernacle. You have these atonements that had to be made for the most holy place, the tent of meeting, for the altar. This glorious, glorious appearing of the Lord that would take place and as the Lord would manifest himself above the Ark of the Covenant. Okay? So what does all that mean? What's that all about? Well, again, it represents the holiness of God and the glory of the Lord appearing and atonement being made on behalf of the people for their sins. Then Aaron was instructed to do something else. He was told to release what is known as the scapegoat, to release the scapegoat. He was told to do several things. Look at verse 5. In verse 5, he's told to cast lots over two particular goats that were chosen. It says, from the Israelite community, he is to take two male goats for a sin offering and a ram for the burnt offering. Then look down to verses 7 through 10. It says, then he is to take the two goats and present them before the Lord at the entrance to the tent of meeting. He is to cast lots for the two goats, one for the Lord and one for the other, which is called the scapegoat. And Aaron shall bring the goat whose lot falls to the Lord and sacrifice it for a sin offering. But the goat chosen by Lot as the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to be used for making atonement by sending it into the desert as a scapegoat. And so all of you are familiar with that term scapegoat. It's when somebody takes responsibility for someone else, right? Or it's placed on somebody else. And so two goats were to be chosen by Aaron, and they were brought to the entrance there to the tabernacle, and they cast lots, and in some manner, one goat was chosen to be sacrificed on the altar, and the other goat was chosen to be the scapegoat. And ultimately, this goat was to be taken outside the camp, and it would be released out into the wilderness, and it would be let go. And so that was to represent the sin of the people being sent away from the presence of the Lord. Okay? So they were to cast lots over the goat. Secondly, the priest was to lay both hands on the head of the scapegoat. Look at verses 20 through 22. 
It says, when Aaron has finished making atonement for the most holy place, the tent of meeting in the altar, he shall bring forward the live goat. He is to lay both hands on the head of the live goat and confess over it all the wickedness and rebellion of the Israelites and all their sins. Put them on the goat's head. He shall then send the goat away into the desert in the care of a man appointed for that task. The goat will carry on itself all their sins to a solitary place and the man shall release it in the desert. And so the priest, Aaron, was to put both of his hands on the head of this goat and confess all the sins of the people. This particular man that had been appointed was to take this goat out into the desert, out into the wilderness, and just let it go, send it away. Now, I read that the first time I thought about it. And I thought, there is no way if my wife was around that that goat wouldn't be brought back into the, ta- tab- into the camp. You know, she'd go out there and find that thing, right? Or, and I thought, well, what if the thing wanders back? You know, a goat will wander back. A horse will find its way back to the stable, right? And I thought, well, that thing's going to find its way back into the, into the camp, probably. Well, it's not in the Bible, but in the Mishnah, in the, the writings, the Jewish writings, we're told that it, at some point there that the man who took it out into the wilderness was to throw it down a cliff, throw it down a ravine so that it would die. Probably for that very reason, I suspect, that the goat might find its way back to the camp. But the point is, it was to be sent away from the people, away from the camp, away from the presence of the Lord, representing that their sins had to be removed from God's presence. Can you see that, how clear that is? And it's interesting that the priest was to put both of his hands on the head of the goat. Earlier in the, in the book of Leviticus, we're told that if somebody brought a sacrificial animal to be offered on behalf of their sins, that that person would actually place his hand on the goat or on the animal, representing that person's sins being placed on that animal. Then they would sacrifice that animal on the altar. But in this case, the scapegoat was to be taken out into the wilderness and let go, representing the sins being sent away from the presence of the Lord. Then in verse 26, we're told that the man who had the appointment to take the goat had to, to bathe himself. Look at verse 26. It says, The man who releases the goat as a scapegoat must wash his clothes and bathe himself with water, and afterward he may come back into the camp. Isn't that amazing, all the detail and instructions that were given? Again, representing the seriousness of sin in the presence of the Lord. Aaron also had to take his garments off, the linen garments off, and bathe, put his priestly garments back on before he could offer the animal sacrifices as a burnt offering before the Lord. And so you have the release of the scapegoat. And so you've got the cleansing of the tabernacle. You've got, uh, you've got the next thing that happens, which is the glorious appearing of the Lord. And you've got the, the sending away of the scapegoat into the wilderness to send the sin of the people away from God's presence. Now, that's really amazing. This is what took place on the day of atonement. Now, what does that mean for us? What is the prophetic significance of this for us, for the church. I think all of this represents the return of the Lord to the earth. Just as the festival of trumpets, I believe, represents the rapture of the church that's going to happen before a seven-year period of tribulation on the earth. The Bible says the Lord will come as a thief in the night, very suddenly, very unexpectedly. The church is going to be taken back to the Father's house, back to heaven for a seven-year period of time, why there's terrible judgment and tribulation taking place here on the earth, then at the end of that seven-year period, the Bible tells us that the Lord Jesus Christ is going to return all the way to the earth. This time, he's going to come all the way to the earth. Sometimes it's referred to as the glorious appearing of the Lord. Sometimes it's called the second coming of the Lord. And so it represents the Lord coming all the way back to the earth. Now, In Matthew 24, Jesus talked about this glorious return, the glorious return of Jesus. Notice in verses 29 and 30, Jesus is explaining this to his disciples. And he's talking about this terrible time of of tribulation, of great distress. And he said, immediately after the distress, note that, after the distress of those days, this is at the end of the tribulation time, The sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and all the nations of the earth will mourn. 
And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and what? Great glory. You see the glorious appearing of the Lord? And so just as you had the, the Shekinah, the glorious appearing of the Lord above the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant and the Holy of Holies in the presence of the high priest, you're going to have the glorious appearing, the glory of the Lord himself appearing when he returns to this earth. It's the Shekinah. It's the Shekinah of the Lord when Jesus Christ comes back. Isn't that going to be something? And guess what? We're all going to be coming with him, right? We're all going to be in heaven because he's going to rapture us out of this place. We're going to be with him in heaven. Seven years later, we're going to be coming back with him. That's going to be something, isn't it? Isn't that going to be amazing? And so the glorious appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to look forward here in the scriptures over to the second to the last book in the Bible. Look over to Zechariah chapter 14. The second to the last book in the Old Testament. Zechariah chapter 14. And we're going to begin at verse 3. And this has to do with the Lord defeating his enemies when he comes back. This is the second coming of the Lord. Zechariah 14 beginning at verse 3. We're going to read through verse 9. It says, Then the Lord will go out and fight against those nations as he fights in the day of battle. And on that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives east of Jerusalem. And the Mount of Olives will be split in two from east to west, forming a great valley with half the mountain moving north and half of it moving south. You will flee by my mountain valley, for it will extend to exile. You will flee as you fled from the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. Then the Lord my God will come and all the holy ones with him. That's us coming back with the Lord. On that day there will be no light, no cold or frost. It will be a unique day without daytime or nighttime, a day known to the Lord. When evening comes, there will be light. And on that day, living water will flow out from Jerusalem, half to the eastern sea and half to the western sea. That's a reference to the sea, the Mediterranean Sea and the Dead Sea. It says, and in summer and in winter. Then it says, the Lord will be king over the whole earth and on that day there will be one Lord in his name, the only name. And so that's a reference to the return of the Lord when he comes back. And, and the Bible says that his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, the very place that he left about 2,000 years ago when he ascended up to the Father. He will return to that very mountain. The Bible says that the, there's going to be a great earthquake and the Mount of Olives is going to split in two. Half of it's going to move north and half of it's going to move south. There's going to be a great valley there. And we're going to see how the glory of the Lord is going to re-enter the temple of the Lord. So the temple's got to be rebuilt. And also talks about this living water that's going to flow from the, the base of the temple. And the water will go to the, to the west, to the Mediterranean, and also to the east, to the Dead Sea. And the Bible says that it's going to make the, the salt water in the Dead Sea fresh. And there'll be fish in the Dead Sea. It's representing life. Life is being given by the Lord. And so this is the second coming. This is the glorious appearing of the Lord when His feet rest on the Mount of Olives. At the rapture, we're caught up to meet Him, right? And we go back to heaven with Him. Seven years later, He comes back. His feet rest on the Mount of Olives and He returns all the way to the earth. Now back up just a little bit from where you're at there and look in Ezekiel 43. Ezekiel 43, look at verse 2. Ezekiel had seen the glory of the Lord depart from the temple. Now he has a vision where the glory of the Lord returns to the temple. Ezekiel 43, verse 2. Ezekiel says, I saw the glory of the God of Israel coming from the east. His voice was like the roar of rushing waters, and the land was radiant with his glory. And look down to verses 4 and 5. The glory of the Lord entered the temple through the gate facing east. Then the Spirit lifted me up and brought me into the inner court, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. You see how the glory of the Lord, the Shekinah, is going to return to the temple? So we know that temple's got to be rebuilt. And the glory of the Lord is going to fill that temple. You see the connection there? On the Day of Atonement, I think this thing is going to happen on the very day 
of atonement. That one day of the year, the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies and offer this sacrificial blood on behalf of him and his family and their sins and the sins of the people. And the glory of the Lord, the Shekinah of the Lord would appear above the Ark of the Covenant. And so here you have the glory of the Lord again returning to the temple. After all these, these centuries, the glory of the Lord is going to return to the temple. And I think that it's going to happen on the day of atonement. Doesn't that make sense? It's just incredible. To me. All these things we've seen, the, the spring festivals and now the fall festivals, where all these things were precisely fulfilled by the Lord himself. And now I think that this second coming of the Lord, this glorious appearing of Christ, is also going to happen to the very detail on the very day of atonement as it did in the past. The glory of the Lord will appear. And so the glory, the glory of the Lord is going to fill the temple, that Shekinah of the Lord. And then something else happens when the Lord comes back. He's going to rescue those that have been saved during the tribulation time, the Bible says that there's going to be a great multitude of people that are saved during the tribulation time. Initially, the church is removed, and we all go to be with the Lord in heaven. Seven years goes by, but during that time, a great multitude of people are going to be saved. They're going to come to faith in the Lord, and so they're going to be persecuted by the Antichrist and go through a terrible, terrible ordeal, and then the Lord is going to return and rescue them from all this terrible ordeal that they've been through. And it's going to be a time of redemption, the redemption of the believers on the earth. In Matthew 24, again, in verse 31, Jesus said that the Lord will send his angels with a loud trumpet call. Remember last Sunday we talked about the trumpet blast on the rapture of the church, the day of trumpets? Well, do you know that they also blow the trumpet at the end of the day of atonement? Trumpet representing someone's coming. A great event is occurring. Also as a warning pronouncement of, of, of the coming of someone great. And so certainly it's a reference to the Lord. And it says, And they, these angels will gather the Lord's elect from the four winds from one end of the heavens to the other. So all the believers are going to be gathered by the Lord when he comes back, I believe, on the day of atonement and that trumpet blast, gathering, the gathering of the people together. That's what the trumpet blast would signify. And I also believe clearly that the nation of Israel will believe in Jesus as the Messiah. All this time, for the most part, the Israelites have been in disbelief about Jesus as the Savior, right? They've not received him as the promised Messiah. They're still waiting for the Messiah to come. I had a, a brother-in-law who got married years ago to a Jewish girl. I told you about this amazing Jewish wedding that they had and everything, and her family was very traditional in the Jewish faith and all of that, and so they had this amazing Jewish wedding, and they had the rabbi there and everything. And I remember asking the rabbi, why don't you Jews, why don't you believe in Jesus as the Messiah? It's so obvious to me. It seems so clear to me that the scriptures point to Jesus as the fulfillment of the coming Messiah, but they don't believe that. And he said, well, he said, because there are verses in the Torah that have not been fulfilled by Jesus. One of those, of course, is all the enemies of Israel being defeated and all the people of Israel coming to believe in the Messiah. He said, that didn't happen. And of course, we know why that is. The Bible speaks of the first coming of the Lord Jesus Christ as a suffering servant. He came to offer himself as a sacrifice for sin on the cross. Clearly, the Bible teaches that, right? But it also teaches that he's going to come again. When he comes again, he's going to come in glory. And the whole world shall see him. And he's coming as a reigning king, as a victorious king. And the whole world will worship him. That's the second coming. You see, so many of the Jews do not see that as a first coming and a second coming. They don't understand that that has yet to been fulfilled. And so, so many of them have not believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. But when Jesus comes back, the nation of Israel will believe in him as the Messiah. That doesn't mean that every single Israelite is going to believe in Jesus. What it means is the nation as a whole is going to come to believe in Jesus as the promised Messiah. Notice here in Romans chapter 11, verse 25, the Apostle Paul says that Israel has experienced a hardening 
in part until the full number of Gentiles has come in. And he says, so all Israel will be saved. As it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will turn godlessness away from Jacob. And this is my covenant with them when I, what? I take away their sins. And so Paul here is writing about this, this hardening among the Israelites as a nation that have not believed in Jesus as the Messiah. Now, did a little research on that word hardening. In the Greek, it's porosis. And it means to be obtuse or to have a lack of understanding. It means to, to kind of have a stubbornness, a stubborn misunderstanding or a refusal to believe. I don't think this is a God-imposed hardening. I think this is a hardening of their own hearts against the Lord. The same word is used by the Lord Jesus to represent the Pharisees. Remember the Pharisees were always trying to catch Jesus doing something wrong. They didn't believe in him. And one day he's about to heal someone and happened to be on the Sabbath. And he was angry, the Bible says. He was angry when he looked upon the Pharisees because of the hardness of their hearts, the hardening of their hearts. They did that themselves. They refused to believe in Jesus out of jealousy and wickedness and evil. They hardened their hearts. The Apostle Paul used that same word to describe the Gentiles. In the futile thinking of their mind, the darkening of their minds, they hardened their hearts against the truth and did not believe the truth. And so this is something that they imposed upon themselves. I think that's what this means here. I don't think this is a God-imposed hardening against Israel. I think it's a self-imposed hardening. You say, what does that mean? Well, you know, it's very difficult. Isn't it very difficult for somebody to come out of one religious tradition and embrace another one? It's really, really hard. How many of you were something other than a Baptist at one time? Okay. I'm going to tell you something. I have great respect for those who've been raised in another religious tradition of some kind, and they study the scriptures and they come to understand the truth and they come out of that past traditional belief and they embrace something else, the truth. It's very hard. Folks that have been steeped in a particular religion or belief system of some kind for a long time, especially if they get deeply involved in that, it's really, really hard for them to come out of that. You've probably seen that yourself, haven't you? I think that's what's going on. So many of the Jewish folks have been steeped in that tradition for so many years, all these centuries and everything, and it's very much a part of them. And it's hard for them. They've hardened their hearts against the truth, and they cannot see the truth when it's just staring them in the face. They've hardened their hearts. But when the Lord Jesus Christ comes back at the second coming, they're going to see the glory of the Lord coming. They're going to witness that Shekinah of the Lord coming back. And they've had three and a half years of listening to the preaching of two witnesses in Jerusalem. I believe it's Moses and Elijah who come to preach the gospel. For three and a half years, they've listened to the preaching of the gospel. And then they look up and they see the Shekinah, the glory of the Lord coming to rescue them. Then the nation of Israel, for the most part, are going to embrace the Lord in faith. They're going to believe in Him as the promised Messiah. Isn't that glorious? What a glorious day that's going to be when the Lord Jesus Christ comes back. We're going to be coming back with Him. His feet are going to rest on the Mount of Olives. His glory is going to re-enter that temple, into the temple of the Lord, and He's going to reign on this earth as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Amen? Isn't that great? I think that's going to happen on the Day of Atonement. Makes perfect sense to me. Last Sunday I told you I think that the rapture is going to happen on Rosh Hashanah, the Festival of Trumpets. Folks say, well, how can that be? Jesus said you don't know the day or the hour. And I shared with you how that's a Greek, I'm sorry, a, a Jewish idiom. The day or the hour. Jesus was referring to the, the new moon that would occur at the beginning of Rosh Hashanah. And, and there was an idiom, a Jewish idiom that said, nobody knows the day or the hour of the new moon. That's the beginning of that Rosh Hashanah. And so they made it a two-day observance. It was a two-day observance. 
And Jesus said, when I come back, nobody's going to know the day or the hour of my return. I think that's what he meant. We don't know what day it's going to be. It's a two-day observance. But I think it's going to be during the Festival of Trumpets. And I think the second coming of the Lord, the glorious appearing of the Lord, is going to take place on the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, seven years and ten days after the rapture of the church. Isn't that amazing? Now, I could be wrong. We all get to heaven someday, and the Lord says, Randy, you had it all wrong. I said, that's okay. I'm not going to hold my breath and say, let me out of here. You know, I'll be fine with that, okay? But this is exciting to me because it makes so much sense. Isn't this the most logical thing you've ever seen in your life? This is the Word of God. And I think Jesus is going to come back after the tribulation time on the Day of Atonement. Then something spectacular is going to happen after that, and that's what we're going to look at next week. There's another festival left, the final festival called the Festival of Tabernacles. What does that mean? What does that mean to us? That's what we're going to look at next week. All during this message, I talked about the holiness of God. God's perfect. We're sinners, right? You cannot have a relationship with God unless your sin is forgiven. It's the only way to have a relationship with God. It's the only way to go to heaven. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man, no man can come unto the Father but by me. He is the only way. He's not the way shower. He is the way. He is the only way. The only way to go to heaven is to have a relationship with the Son of God, to know Him as your personal Savior, to trust in Him and place your faith in Him as your sacrifice for sin. He took your place. He paid the atonement so that you could go to heaven someday. Do you know Him as your Savior? Have you made that decision? Are you sure? If you're not sure, you don't want to leave this place this morning until you make sure, right? There's two fancy Greek words that theologians use talking about this price that's paid. One of them is propitiation, atonement, propitiation. Propitiation is something that's given for something, on behalf of something. And so it has to do with the sacrifice of the Lord being given on our behalf, the Lord Jesus Christ is the propitiation, the atonement for our sins. He paid the price for our sins, right? And that other word is expiation. Expiation means to go out. It's when that sin is sent away from the presence of the Lord. As far as the east is from the west, because of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, that's when you're justified, made righteous in the sight of God. And just like that scapegoat was sent away from the presence of the Lord, out into the wilderness, away from the Lord, the expiation of sin, sin being sent away because of your faith in Christ. Have you made that decision? Have you trusted in Christ as your Savior? Do you know Him? When did that happen? You say, well, I don't remember all the details. Well, I'm going to tell you something. If you've been saved, you ought to know when it happened. You were there, right? You may not know the day, but you know when it happened. You know the circumstances of that experience, don't you? I was an 11-year-old boy when I got saved. I became convicted of my sin as best I knew how, I invited Jesus Christ to come into my life and to save me from my sins. And I remember praying with the pastor and asking Jesus to save me from my sins so that I could go to heaven someday. That's the greatest decision I've ever made in my life. I'd never regret that for a minute. Who would? And I was gloriously, amazingly saved by the grace of God when I made that decision. Do you have that testimony this morning? Have you been saved? Are you absolutely sure? If you're not sure, you need to make sure this morning. I'm come in just a moment. Pray with me here at the front. Invite Jesus Christ to come into your heart and save you from your sin. Amen? Let's all stand and pray.